At this point in time, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Silk Road or some parts of its history. With the rising popularity of cryptocurrency, many people are now aware of these dark web marketplaces. And just because the Silk Road no longer exists, nothing has stopped countless other illegal marketplaces from taking their position. Wherever there's money to be made, there are always people willing to fight or go to extreme lengths to get that reward. Rarely do we ever get to pull back the curtain and see exactly what goes on on the dark web. But today, that's a little bit different. Today, we're going to be reading through some of the bone-chilling messages sent by the owner of the Silk Road. And naturally, you might be curious as to what lengths that person had to go to to keep business running smoothly. And these logs will give you a pretty good idea into the paranoia involved with running these operations. These message logs are one hell of a read and a disturbing look into the dark side of the internet. So with that being said, today we're going to take a look at the Silk Road's hit list. Now to that stunning arrest of the drug kingpin who goes by the name Dread Pirate Roberts, appears to have cornered the internet drug market. His real name is Ross Albrecht and his website Silk Road. Court documents say Silk Road sold $1.2 billion worth of drugs and illegal services in just under three years. Do you assume or should we assume that the NSA was involved in uh, corroborating or gathering evidence uh, which they might have denied in the actual trial? Yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, that's, that was easy enough. You're the Dread Pirate Roberts. Admit it. With pride. But the surprise of the sentencing, one of the things that the government contended in, in its case was that, was that he actually solicited the killings of as many as six people to prevent his identity. What role do you think that had in the sentencing? Silk Road user threatened to reveal the identities of thousands of others. So investigators say Ulbricht tried to execute a murder for hire on that user, offering $150,000. Is that a fair trial? No, I don't think so. In a way, Ross Ulbricht is the American dream. He's an entrepreneur. He saw a new market. He went for it. I mean, that's like, is that any different from the genesis of Coca-Cola or General Motors or Philip Morris? General Motors kill their customers. Philip Morris kill their customers. Coca-Cola kill their customers and workers. This guy is just an entrepreneur. He's simply embracing the explicit structure and policies of the United States capitalism. There's no difference at all. There is difference. Drugs is illegal. Depending on who you ask, Ross Ulbricht is someone who is either regarded as a saint or a dangerous criminal. And I don't think this guy is either of those things personally, but I do need to give a fair bit of context before we get into the actual messages I want to go over. Ross Ulbricht's case is widely covered on the internet, so I don't want to act like I'm the first one to mention this. But the thing is, whenever there is coverage of this topic, for some reason, these messages are completely left out. I'm going to go over Ross's trial at the end of this video, so I ask that you hold all opinions or what you know previously until you've watched the entirety of this video. To begin this story, let's go back to 2011. The very first mention of the Silk Road website came from a forum called shroomery.org, dated January 27th, 2011, where one user by the name of Altoid started a new thread that read the following. I came across this website called Silk Road. It's a Tor hidden service that claims to allow you to buy and sell anything online anonymously. I'm thinking of buying off of it, but I wanted to see if anyone here had heard of it or could recommend it. I found it through silkroad.wordpress.com, which if you have a Tor browser, it redirects you to the real site at this onion link. Let me know what you think. This post got a couple of replies and was later buried, but since it is the first mention of the site anywhere on the internet, and the fact that he said let me know what you think at the end of it, it was believed that this was some sort of advertising tactic, which caused the FBI to look into the username of who Altoid was. Conveniently, the moniker Altoid also had an account on Bitcoin Talk, the official Bitcoin forum. If you look through this forum user's post history, you'll start to realize that this person had quite a few bitcoins to their name. The most notable, however, was the final post from Altoid that was dated October 11th, 
2011 and is still up to this day, and it reads the following. Hello. Sorry if there's another thread for this kind of post, but I couldn't find one. I'm looking for the best and brightest IT pro in the Bitcoin community to be the lead developer in a venture-backed Bitcoin startup company. The ideal candidate would have at least several years of web application development experience, having built applications from the ground up, a solid understanding of OOP, and software architecture is a must. Experience in a startup environment is a plus, or just being super hardworking, self-motivated, and creative. Compensation can be in the form of equity or a salary or somewhere in between. If interested, please send your answers to the following email. This email address, in part with the other posts on his forum account, ultimately led the FBI to start tracking Ross in an ongoing investigation. Sometime after this discovery, a package of Ulbricht's was intercepted in the mail that contained various fake IDs, all with Ulbricht's face on it. When he was questioned about the fake IDs at his doorway, he stated that they weren't his and that anyone could have bought them online at some place like the Silk Road. Ross Ulbrich was monitored up through 2013, where undercover agents had tracked him to the San Francisco Public Library. By then, investigators knew his computer would encrypt itself if it was closed, so they had to get him with his computer open. Due to this proposed dilemma, two undercover agents created a diversion by pretending to be a couple fighting nearby. This caught Ross off guard, which caused him to get out of his seat at the library, where another agent ran in and snatched his computer while it was still open. Ross was caught logged into the mastermind section or dashboard on his computer, and inside his computer, on top of that, was a full diary dedicated to the creation of the Silk Road, as written by him. Now that you have a somewhat general understanding as to how Ross Ulbrich was caught by the feds, it's time to get to the main point of this video. First and foremost, let me introduce you to some of the characters that are going to be in this transcript. Dread Pirate Roberts is Ross Ulbricht, and this is a reference to the movie Princess Bride. If you're familiar with the movie The Princess Bride, then you'll realize how clever of a name Dread Pirate Roberts actually is, because it insinuates that multiple people ran the website, but more on that later. The next character that I'd like to go over is Lucy Drop, who was one of the top vendors on the Silk Road. Lucy Drop became a well-known vendor, as I said, and built up a very, very, very strong reputation prior to exit scamming. If you're not familiar with exit scamming, it is essentially when you build up a ton of reputation as a seller and then completely cash out and don't fulfill orders. Leading up to the messages we're about to read, Lucy Drop claimed that they were in prison for seven months and that they had a business partner that stole their account go figure. If that doesn't sound sketchy enough, when Lucy Drop returned to the forums, they claimed that they were sad because they lost everything and everything was stolen from them, and on top of that, they claimed they wanted to come back and get their old account frozen and that they would never sell again and that they just wanted to wish everyone a good life. There are striking similarities between Lucy Drop and another scammer. This infamous vendor went by the name Tony76. They also exit scammed in a very, very similar way by building up reputation over a few months and then running a sale. Both vendors were from a certain part in Canada and both of them sold the exact same type of product. On top of all of that, both of them shared very similar idiosyncrasies when it came to typing. Even six years ago, it was speculated that they were the same person. As a result of being a scammer in the marketplace, Tony76 was not liked by Ross Ulbricht because scamming on his marketplace damaged his brand. Keep all of this in the back of your mind as we get into these messages. The next character that is referenced in this log is Friendly Chemist, who wasn't a vendor, but someone who claimed to be a middleman between the Hells Angels and Lucy Drop. Throughout these messages, Friendly Chemist is frantic and he claims that he needs $500,000 or else he's going to release the names of thousands of customers on the Silk Road. I'll let most of the messages speak for themselves for this character, but let's move on to the final character. Lastly, we have Red and White, and in these messages, they are supposedly from the Hells Angels. This is the person that Friendly Chemist is in debt to for about $700,000. Now finally, with all of that context out of the way, let's get into these messages one by one, and I'll give analysis as we go along. Let's get into that.
just a side note before we get into these messages, this is a long read, so I highly advise that you get comfortable, or if you just want to listen, that works too. Where you can find these messages is Government Exhibit 936-14-CR-68. Now that you know all the characters, let's begin. So, basically, the first message comes from March 13th, 2013 at 8.50am from Friendly Chemist. The subject line of this message is very important. The message says, Can you please get Dread Pirate Roberts to message me right away? It's very serious. It's a matter of life and death. and also has to do with identities of dozens of top vendors and thousands of Silk Road customers. It's very important, so please get him to me right away. Friendly Chemist says, I will not talk to anyone but Dread Pirate Roberts, so please do not ask me what it's concerning. The next morning, on March 14th, 7.57 a.m., 2013, Ross Ulbricht then responds to Friendly Chemist and says, what can I do for you? Friendly Chemist then gets back to Ross on March 14th at 11.26 a.m. He says, what's going on? When are you paying Lucy Drop? I've been waiting and waiting, and he keeps saying he's waiting for you to pay. You don't know me, but I'm Lucy Drop's supplier. The only reason I lent Lucy Drop so much product is because he showed me the chat logs of you and him talking and how you made him the number one seller on the Silk Road. I lent him $900,000 of product and he paid me 200 k and started avoiding me. I see you and him still have listings up, so I know for a fact he does not have any product. Why are you guys scamming people for hard-earned money? I stopped by Lucy Drop's house and he doesn't live there anymore and his phone goes straight to voicemail, but I know he's been on Silk Road and he says he's waiting for you. What's the deal? Where's my money? Why is Lucy Drop still selling when I know for a fact he has no product because I supplied him? I'm freaking out here. That was not my money. I'm getting scared. My wife said she saw people at my kid's school and I'm really getting worried. I put a keylogger on Lucy Drop's computer when he left the room one day when I was there so I could see what he was doing and I see he's still selling when I know he doesn't have product. Why are you guys pulling a scam? Why? I also have the identities of 9 top vendors and 15 smaller vendors and thousands of customers of Lucy Drop's. I don't want any trouble but I want my money and if you haven't paid Lucy Drop, pay him. If you have to pay him, then tell him to pay me. I'm scared for my family. If you don't believe me, here is Lucy's password info. Here we see the attached password from Lucy Drop and the withdraw password which is used to pull money out of the Silk Road. And then he says, I will not do anything until you message me and tell me what's going on. Please get him to pay me as soon as possible or pay him ASAP if you haven't. This is my life here and I'm scared for my family because of the money I owe. So here we have a guy claiming that he put a keylogger on Lucy Drop's computer and that computer has now been lost because it was stolen by the partner conveniently enough. On March 14th, 2013 at 7.34 p.m., Ross Ulbricht would respond and say, I'm really sorry for your situation, but I never had such a conversation with Lucy Drop. He slash she must have made it up to trick you. We have no special deal whatsoever. Friendly Chemist would then respond at 10.54 p.m. and say, I find it very hard to believe he showed me chat logs talking to you about you making him the number one seller and being his partner on the product I gave him. I would not have given him that much product otherwise, especially because you made him the number one seller. Please don't screw me like this. My life is in danger because of this money I owe. I also know about the other vendor accounts his friends were using. I have access to those customer lists too, from when Lucy Drop was drop shipping for them. I'm not this kind of person, but the only card I have left to play is dropping two dozen vendor identities and thousands of customer details on the web and the forums what do you and Lucy Drop think will happen if thousands of usernames and order amounts, addresses, all get leaked? All of those people will leave Silk Road and be scared to use it again. Those vendors will all be busted and all their customers will be exposed too and never go back to Silk Road. I don't want to do that. I just want my money for my product, my life is in danger, and maybe my family. Those people I borrowed money from are not regular people. I can't believe I was so stupid and trusting. Just get Lucy Drop to pay me my money and get my money as soon as possible. And if you haven't paid him yet, then pay so he pays me the money he owes. Please, I'm freaking out here. A day later on March 15th, 2013 at 6.49 a.m., Ross Ulbrich would then respond and say, I will get in touch with Lucy Drop and get back to you. Send me all of the information you've harvested so I can verify it. Four minutes later at 6.53 a.m., Dread Pirate Roberts would send a message to Lucy Drop with the subject line, Friendly Chemist. The message said, Hi Lucy Drop, I've been contacted by a member named Friendly Chemist. He claims to know you and have done business with you in real life. He's making wild accusations and threats against you and me and other members of my community. If you indeed know him, could you please provide me with his name and address 
I'd like to stop him in his tracks by revealing that I know who he is and will retaliate if he does anything stupid. Any other info you can provide is also welcome. Thanks and sorry for the trouble. DPR. P.S. Please don't contact him. I'd like to handle him myself. This is a really stupid move if Lucy Drop's computer was actually keylogged, but under those circumstances, I guess he's testing the bluff. On March 15th at 9.17 a.m., Friendly Chemist would then get back to DPR and say, I didn't harvest anything. Lucy Drop kept a log of every single transaction he made on the Silk Road like an idiot. There are thousands and thousands of orders, and there are over 20 vendor identities from where he did biz with them. Some with phone numbers, too, and over 5,000 customer identities. He also ran more than one account on here and seems to be still vending on those accounts, too, and did everything from one computer, so I have their info, too. You already know that I have access to his account, and you can see most of his orders are not encrypted, so I don't know why you're asking me to send all the info to you now. The only reason I can understand this is unless you wanted to warn all those people so you and Lucy Drop don't have to pay me. His username, his password, and his withdrawal password. You say you're not working with him, but you still haven't closed his account when you know he is scamming, but I will give you the address of some of the customers, and you can see he kept logs this whole time. Here are some of his very first sales when he was selling three tab samples when he first started vending. You can contact them to see if it's true. Clearly, Ross was being threatened with real identities, and this is why the government actually redacted this in the court documents. Getting back to Friendly Chemist's message, it continues as, and the log goes like that, up till today, every day, and that's just one of his accounts. He has three, and he uses each one for a different thing. But I'm sure you know this, or else why else would you let his account stay open? I don't want to do anything with this info, and I won't. I just want my money. I'm scared for my life, and you and him are not giving me an answer. Maybe if I post all the vendor identities publicly, and nobody sells on the Silk Road, Lucy Drop will have no more sales or people to scam on his other account. I just want what's owed to me, and I will go away. I don't know why you people scam like this. People work hard for their money, and you are playing with people's lives. I will wait for your reply from Lucy Drop, but I don't know how much longer I can wait. How can I explain to these people that I don't have their money when I said I would have it on a certain day, and now I'm late? These are not normal people, and they're getting angry with me. Just get Lucy Drop to resolve this, or pay him, or he can pay me. I did a favor, and this is not fair to play with my life like this. Later that same day, DPR would get back to Friendly Chemist and said, I'll let you know when I hear from Lucy Drop. On March 15th at 8.42 p.m., Friendly Chemist would once again message DPR pleading his case. I'll show the message here on screen, but I'm not going to read through it because it's basically the exact same thing he said earlier in that day. On March 16th at 5.22 a.m., real Lucy Drop would join the Silk Road forums. Here, Real Lucy Drop would post the following thread. Do not buy from Lucy Drop on Silk Road. I can't talk about the specifics for security reasons, but I was in jail for more than two months, but less than seven. I got released very recently. Lucy Drop on Silk Road is not me. Do not buy from that account. My partner completely f***ed me over. I went to our spot and there's nothing there and he won't answer my phone calls. He took the work computer and everything else. He took my entire savings with him that was being used to keep the supply up. He took my entire life. Somebody please get in contact with DPR or vendor support and have the account shut down immediately and freeze all the funds in that account. How can I contact DPR? I can't find a link to message him. I can prove to him that I'm the real Lucy Drop, but I do not have access to my PGP or any of my logins. If you ordered from me in the past, namely a couple of top vendors, I can give you details and you can verify slash vouch that I am indeed the real Lucy Drop. Do not trust anything that is said from the Lucy Drop account. Do not send any funds. Do not finalize anything. I just want to point out that it's very convenient that after Lucy Drop exit scammed, that this entire story came about as soon as this friendly chemist guy shows up on the scene to blackmail. Just keep that in mind. On March 16th, 2013 at 2.15 p.m., DPR would send a message to real Lucy Drop that said, Hi there, how did the new person gain access to your account? At 8.57 that same day, real Lucy Drop would respond with a message that said, It's not a new person who took over the account. It was my partner in real life that I started Lucy Drop with. I was the one that actually handled the Lucy Drop account until I got arrested. I was picked up on a previous warrants and spent some time in jail. My partner took absolutely everything from me in that time, he took all the work computers, the Bitcoin wallets, all of the work product, and nearly my entire life savings and scammed a bunch of people in the process. 
Friendly Chemist was our middleman to one of our Lucy distributors. I called him after I got released and he's demanding I pay him some deal he had with my partner when I was in jail and telling me he will do something very stupid if he doesn't get paid. How do you know Friendly Chemist? Keep in mind at this point, Dread Pirate Roberts never once brought up Friendly Chemist to real Lucy Drop, he brought it up to the other account. Regardless, the next day, at March 17th, 4.48 AM, Dread Pirate Roberts would respond to real Lucy Drop and say, I'm so glad you know him. He's gathered personal information about many of the customers who worked with Lucy Drop, not sure if you're in control of the account back at the time or not, and has some other info on other vendors on Silk Road. Now he's trying to blackmail me and say that he'll release all of this info. If this happened, this would be terrible. I need his real world identity so I can threaten him with violence if he were to release any names, addresses, or anything you have. It sounds like he's in a tough spot that your former partner put him in, but I can't get involved and I can't release those IDs. Thank you for any help you can provide. Lucy Drop would then respond at 10.59 PM the same day and say, I don't know how I feel about that violent solution. Remember that he also knows my real world identity and has evidence on me as well. I'm sure you are aware of what would happen to me if any of my information was to be released. If he had access to that computer, there is a lot more damaging stuff on there than just the identities of a bunch of vendors and a bunch of customers of mine. There is enough on that computer to put me away for a very long time. He's acting really erratic right now, understandably because of his given situation, but I will set up a meeting with him and try and reason with him. It is also in my best interest that he does not release anything, as well as in the best interest of this movement we are a part of, putting power in people's hands. I f***ing hate when money does that to people. I am in contact with him and I told him I am talking to you and I'm going to have a meeting with him and try and resolve this problem of ours. Ross Ulbrick then responds at 1.27 AM, just a few hours later, and says, okay Lucy, do me proud. On March 19th, 2013 at 9.36 AM, Lucy Drop would respond with the following message. I went to the meeting with him and he is extremely frightened. He told me who he owes money to, and I understand his concern for his safety because there are not people you want to owe money to. He is freaking out and truly believes that his life and his family's life are in serious danger. He thinks that you don't take him seriously, and he said he was planning on releasing part of the information to show he is serious. I convinced him not to and reassured him that things would be okay. If that information gets leaked and those vendors get busted, I would get busted too. I tried not to show him that I was too concerned with his threats, but I'm not sure how to deal with him. He said he's been doing his research and he said he's discovered a flaw with Silk Road that buyers have never thought about. I'm assuming he's referring to the fact that the vendors all have people's addresses and can use it against Silk Road or the buyers themselves to extort money or what have you. He also kept talking about the shitstorm that would be caused by that much information being leaked by the media slash police picking up on it and starting a mass panic. He said if we don't pay him, he will release the information, and if that does not work, he will go straight to the police with all the information and get into the witness protection program. The people he borrowed the product from are a big criminal organization in Canada, Hells Angels, not sure if you're familiar with them, and the police have been known to treat witnesses against them very well. This is saddening because this guy is not really like this, but I guess with the threat to his family's life, he is under extreme stress and acting out of character. I calmed him down a bit and told him I would find a way to help. That was somewhat of a lie on my part because I don't really know how. I can help him, but I wanted to reassure him that I didn't do anything drastic in the meantime while we find a solution. I told him that you would never really fully trust him to not use the information against him, even if you got paid. And he said the following, I'm recalling this all from memory, so excuse me if it's not completely accurate. He said regardless of anything, he needs to pay the people as soon as possible or he's in grave danger. He offered me a deal because as you know, selling on Silk Road was my income and he was my connection for Lucy. He said he wants to be paid and that he would give me product at his cost so that I could pay you back by selling and giving you the percentage of what he would normally put on top when he was selling it to me. He was putting 50% on top of his cost when he gave it to me. So he suggested that I start vending again and you take 50% of all sales. That way you could be paid back in full. I would be able to sell again on Silk Road and the people he borrowed the product from would be paid back and he would be safe. I said that was a bad deal because you still have all the vendor's information and customer's information. He said that he'd be willing to give you his identity, talk to someone on the phone or verify, or give any other identifying information that could be confirmed as collateral, so we would never have to be able to use that information again. On March 20th, 2013 at 5.58 PM, Dread Pirate Roberts would say, you know his real world identity, don't you? There is no way I will be handing cash over to a person who is threatening me and my community. Give me his ID so I can have some leverage in dealing with him. You said you don't know what to do now, so let me take over and give me all the info you have so I have the best chance of defusing the situation. 
Lucy Drop then responds about an hour and a half later, basically reiterating what we just read about the 50% deal. At 3.29 p.m. that same day, Dread Pirate Roberts would respond and say, don't bother messaging me again if the message does not contain his personal information. I'm not fronting money to anyone and I won't be blackmailed. I would also like the contact info slash ID of the other Lucy Drop that ripped him off and of his suppliers if possible. You don't know how to handle this situation, but I do. Stop showing this guy compassion. He's threatening your life and freedom and my livelihood. On March 21st, 2013, at 12.21 a.m., Lucy Drop would respond and say, If you really think this is a good idea to deal with him, I will give you his personal information you want about his identity. Please understand why I'm hesitant, as it is my freedom we're dealing with. I will also have no income since he was my connection for Lucy. Are there any positions open on Silk Road, support or otherwise? I could really use some sort of job as my partner completely effed me over. Let me know how to send the information to you, plain text, or give me a PGP key to use. At 1.33 a.m., Dread Pirate Roberts would actually send a message to Friendly Chemist and say, Have your suppliers contact me here so I can work something out with them. Do not tell them that I owe you money. That is not true and will only complicate matters. Tell them the truth, that the person who stole your money sold their product on my site and that you are now blackmailing me to get them their money. You should copy and paste this message to them. This is a really interesting move by Dread Pirate Roberts or Ross Ulbricht because he's trying to cut out Friendly Chemist who is a middleman. By getting in contact with suppliers, he can directly grow the Silk Road and that's the reason he's doing this. Three minutes later, Lucy Drop would send a public key and the encrypted PGP message that contained the person's personal information. At 10.44 p.m. on March 21st, he would send a message back to Lucy Drop that says, Please send me the exact address of Friendly Chemist. I might be able to make you a part-time mod. I'll run it by the staff. On March 25th at 10 a.m., a new user would pop up by the name of Red and White. And this is where the negotiating begins. I was asked to contact you. We're the people Friendly Chemist owes money to. He tells us that you owe him money and a long story about some of this and some of that. As far as we're concerned, we gave him the product. Where it went and how does not matter. We told him he's only responsible for the missing product and money. We don't care if you stole it or borrowed it from him or anything. It was his responsibility to pay for it. He asked me to contact you anyways, so what did you want to talk to us about? At 6.27 p.m. the next day, Ross Ulbricht would get back to them. Sorry for the delayed response and thank you for getting in touch. We've had some technical difficulties over the past 24 hours I've had to deal with. Just to be clear, I do not owe him any money, but he has told me his situation and wants my help. I'm not entirely sure what the best action is to take, but I wanted to be in communication with you to see if we could come to a conclusion that works for everyone. Friendly chemists aside, we should talk about how we can do business. Obviously, you have access to illicit substances in quantity, and you are having issues with bad distributors. If you don't already sell here on Silk Road, I'd like you to consider becoming a vendor. Many people here purchase in bulk as well as retail quantities. Being a vendor, you'll have the protection that dealing anonymously in Bitcoin provides, and you'll have protection against people like Friendly Chemist ripping you off, because all transactions are conducted through my escrow. I encourage you to read the wiki and forum, links are in the footer, and consider becoming a vendor here. So, if there's anything I can do as an admin here to help you get involved with Silk Road, or anything I can do to help with your situation with Friendly Chemist, please let me know. At 8.08 p.m., Red and White would get back to him and say, This is interesting. How much is it possible to sell on here if we listed every product far cheaper than everyone else? We have a majority hold over most of the movement of products in Western Canada, one of the main ports in North America. I have researched your site and the concept seems interesting to me, as long as it is as anonymous as everyone makes it out to be. We produce a lot of things that would get this video demonetized and import a lot of other things that would get this video demonetized in bulk amounts. We have a lot of workers who run their own sub-distribution networks for the streets, but if it's lucrative, we're always looking to expand. In my partner's eyes, all they see is that because of online dealing, we are out 700k, so I'm not sure if they're going to go for it. Friendly Chemist refuses to meet up with us because he will fear is what will happen. People are starting to suspect that he will go to the police, which is not a problem, because he would never be able to give up anyone of importance since he has only had a contact with low-level people in our group and they always take precautions so that even if someone were to turn informant, they would not be able to get any charges to stick. It's a shame because he moved a fair amount of product. If he can get friendly chemists to meet up with us or pay his debt, then I'm sure I would be able to get people in our group to give this online side of business a try. As it stands right now, there are people looking for him and since he has avoided our group, I'm not sure what will happen because he owes us money and is avoiding us. 
I looked around your site and the prices are absolutely absurd. I'm assuming most people here are selling three to four tiers below the actual producers and distributors. On March 27th, 2013 at 1116 PM, Ross Ulbrich would send another message to Lucy Drop who hadn't followed up yet. He says, why haven't you gotten the address yet? Bring me Friendly Chemist's address and $1,000 in Bitcoin is yours. 22 minutes later, then Ross Ulbrich would send another message to Red and White that says, In my eyes, Friendly Chemist is a liability, and I wouldn't mind if he was executed, but then you'd be out 700k. I'm not sure how much you already know about the guy, but I have the following info and I'm waiting on getting his address. Blake Krokoff lives in an apartment near White Rock Beach, City, White Rock, Province, British Columbia, has a wife and three kids. Let me know if it would be helpful to have his full address. In those categories, I think you could be doing over 1 million in sales a week within a few months. It's hard to estimate because it depends on how much market share you get and also the site as a whole has been constantly growing. You will need to become very proficient at stealth shipping and packaging if you aren't already. Think vacuum sealers and leaving no forensic evidence on your packages. You will also want to ship from multiple drop points so you can't be traced back to your fake return address. If you go through with this, I would contact some of the top vendors and hire them to consult you. Ask the grass vendors because you wouldn't be competing with them and their product is very smelly and looked for by the USPS, so they have to be on top of their game. I would also start out listing smaller amounts so you can get the hang of it before putting up substantial inventory. You will also need to market yourself on the forums a little bit, maybe at first. Maybe send out some samples to critics. That is one price of anonymity. No one knows you, but if your first customer service is good and your product is cheap, people will quickly catch on and you wouldn't have to do much hustling. Regarding prices, there are some costs here that you don't otherwise see. I take 3-10% to 10 depending on the size of the transaction. If you hedge your escrow balance, and you should, that can cost up to 5% per transaction. And then if you need to convert your bitcoins into another currency, there are other fees associated with that, though not much. There are also occasional losses due to packages lost in the mail. The rest of the markup I think is due, as you say, to the fact that most vendors are pretty far down the distribution chain. Regarding safety and anonymity, we've been operating for over two years now and open as a high profile target and we're still going strong. If you take the necessary precautions and use the technology, I think you can operate very securely and efficiently here, maybe more so than your current operations. March 28th, 2013, 9.01 AM. Red and White goes on to say, I already have that information, but thank you. One million a week sounds like it'd be worth selling on here once we know exactly how everything works. Even if the commission was 15%, it wouldn't matter, as we lose more than 15% on the streets with street level guys getting robbed or arrested and losing product, etc. Also, we've kidnapped Friendly Chemist partner Zinn, and we're already on the hunt for Friendly Chemist. I'll keep you updated on the developments. So far we are liking what we're seeing from the site, and this could be a good partnership for both of us. As far as I can see, this site lacks any big time suppliers. It appears that mostly street level independents are buying small amounts, an ounce to a kilo at a time and selling on here. We have the product and the manpower to do big things here. Forgive me, but it all seems a little too good to be true right now, so we need a little bit of time to research this before we make any sort of commitment. At 4.59 PM the same day, DPR would respond and say, I understand, and that's great news about Zinn. If I understand the situation, he's the one responsible for your loss. By the way, so this Zinn character just came out of nowhere, but that's supposedly Lucy Drop's old partner. You should definitely take your time and start slowly. I would hate for you to make a mistake and be left with a bad experience. Just let me know if you need anything. Also, you should look into PGP. Many customers like to encrypt the receiving address, so you should know how to decrypt it. When you're ready, let me know what account you want to sell with, and I'll cover the $500 security deposit for you. 8.32 PM that same day, Red and White would say, we are familiar with PGP as we've been using it for years via email linked to our smartphones. It's the only other way we communicate with each other aside from in person since phone calls are not secure. There is no loss anymore also. We were able to recover all of our missing product when we grabbed Zinn. After some questioning, he admitted he was intending on moving to a different country and setting up a new seller account on this site. We don't take kindly to thieves. He's gone. I appreciate your offer to waive the fee, but if we were to sell on here, I would pay the same as everyone else. Very kind of you though. I will be in touch. So since Friendly Chemist's partner, or Lucy Drop's old partner, is now taken out, Friendly Chemist is starting to get panicked. On March 29th at 10.23am, Friendly Chemist would reach out once more after a long hiatus. 
you leave me no choice. I want 500K USD in 72 hours or I'm gonna post all the info I have. I can't go back to my home. I had to move my kids and my wife somewhere and I need the money so I can move my family and start a new life. I hate to do this, but I need the money or I'm gonna release it all. Over 5,000 user details and about two dozen vendor identities. What's it gonna be? At 354 that same day, DPR would respond and say, don't do anything foolish. The people that you owe money have caught up to Zen and have reclaimed their loss. I spoke and calmed them down. They're likely going to be coming vendors here on SR. Now you can calm down too. Go back to your normal life and don't get involved with any of this stuff anymore. At 7.43 p.m., Friendly Chemist would then come back and say, you don't think I know what they did to Zen? You think I just go on with my life? You don't know these people. I owed them money and I ran away from them. It's over for me. I need that money to start over somewhere else with my family. I need it. I don't want to do this, but you still don't give me another choice. They are still telling me that I have to meet them, and I don't know what will happen. I can't let that happen. Even if they say it's okay, I know they will do the same thing to me. They say everything is okay, but I know what they will do. 63 hours, please, don't force me to post everything. 500k is nothing to you, but it's life and death for me. They told me I have a free pass and that they dealt with it with Zen, but I know that they are doing that to make me think it's okay, and then they're going to get me. That's how these people operate. At 10.47 p.m., he would respond to Friendly Chemist once more and say, Do me a favor. Make it 96 hours. I will get back to you on Monday. I want to work this out, but I have big plans for this weekend, and I don't want to have to deal with this. March 29th, 2013, 10.55 p.m. Hello again, Red and White. I hate to come with you with a problem when we were just starting to get to know one another, but Blake, friendly chemist, is causing me problems. Are you still looking for him, or now, or have you found Zinn? Have you given up? I'd like to put a bounty on his head, if it's not too much trouble for you. What would be an adequate amount to motivate you to find him? Necessities like this do happen from time to time for a person in my position. I have others I can turn to, but it's always good to have options, and you are close to the case right now. Hopefully this is something you are open to, and can be another aspect of our business relationship. Regards, Dread Pirate Roberts. March 30th, 1242 AM. Red and White writes to DPR. What is the problem? We usually tend to stay away from hits as they're bad for business and bring a lot of heat. Is it a problem that can be resolved, or does he really need to be dealt with sternly? As of right now, we don't care about him because we retrieved more money from Zinn than what he took from us, and he also paid for it with his life. Debt paid in our books, as far as rates go. We don't have a flat rate for things like that. It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Usually we pay our hitters a percentage of what the person owes, plus or minus how much they can retrieve. If it's strictly a hit because they don't want the person around anymore, it's also different. Does he owe you money, or do you just not want him around anymore? I can send a couple of my guys to do recon to find out exactly where he is right now. In the meantime, I'll wait until I hear back from you. At 1.55 AM, DPR writes back, If you can find his location, that may be enough for me to scare him off. He has been trying to blackmail me. Just let me know what you need to make it worth your while. 3.31 AM, that same night, Red and White writes, If I find his location, and you use it against him to scare him, there's a chance he will switch locations again. Speaking from experience, it will be a lot more difficult to find him again after that, once he knows there are people capable of finding him. Further, the people we use to do recon are the hitter themselves. I don't think they'd be interested in continuing to look for him if there was a small sum to be split between them just to find his address. If you have your mind just set on finding his location, I can talk to them and get them to get it to you for a fee. Not sure what amount, as usually we hunt someone, there's more involved after we find them. If you want the deal with him the other way, we can talk about that too, but the price varies in the situation. If you want it to look like an accident, that's going to cost a lot more. It wouldn't be suspicious. He would just leave home one day and not return. If you don't care what it looks like, it would be cheaper than the accident. We use professionals and not street level hoodlums who always end up effing things up. How much does he owe you? And how much are you willing to pay? If there are funds retrieved, how much will we keep from what he has when we get him? If he has anything. In response to this, DPR writes, he doesn't owe me anything, but he's threatening to expose the identities of thousands of my clients that he was able to acquire by working with Zinn if I don't pay him off. As you don't take kindly to thieves, this kind of behavior is unforgivable to me, especially here on Silk Road. Anonymity is sacrosanct. It doesn't have to be clean, and I don't think there are any funds to be retrieved. Red and White gets back to him and says, price for clean is 300k USD. Price for non-clean, 150k to 200k, depending on how you want it done. 
These prices pay for two professional hitters, including the travel expenses and the work they put in. We can use our out-of-town hitters if you want as well, but I would not suggest them because they come with an extra cost and you don't seem to care about how he's taken care of. When would you like this done? On March 31st, 2013 at 8.59 p.m., DPR writes, Don't want to be a pain here, but the prices seem high. Not long ago, I had a clean hit done for 80K. Are the prices you quoted the best you can do? I'd like this done ASAP as he's talking about releasing the info on Monday. Now, what's interesting here is that 80K he's referencing for another hit is actually true. For that hit, however, that was set up by the FBI and they essentially got one of the admins of the site to middleman a deal. And in his cooperation with the FBI, they faked his own death and torture and sent the photos back to Dread Pirate Roberts or Ross. Getting back to the messages, however, we can go back to what Red and White has to say. I'm sorry, we can't do that for that price. The best I can do is 150, and even that is pushing it. Since you need a rush job done, usually we would charge even more. In the interest of the business relationship to be, I could do 150, no lower. If 150 does not work for you, we're gonna have to pass. We use professionals and we pay them a good price. Always send them out in a team of two plus, 75K each for expenses, and the job is a fair amount, I think. We have one of his associates and we're paying him to set him up for us. We'll pay that ourselves on our end. I'm guessing you're not gonna be able to pay cash. So how would your payment work since you need it done before Monday? A couple hours later, Red and White follows up again and says, if you want it done by Monday, that only leaves today. It's Sunday morning here. We always seem to miss each other online. So I will leave a Bitcoin address in case you wanna pay that way. Probably the best so we can get used to dealing with Bitcoins anyways, since we will be selling here more than likely in the next week or two. I will check the computer in about 10 hours. And if I see that you wanna go ahead with this and the payment has been sent, We'll go ahead and do it today. Here's the Bitcoin wallet address. If you want picture confirmation of the job afterwards, give me random numbers and I will have them write them beside him and take a picture for you. DPR then gets back to him a few hours later and says, thank you, red and white. I've only ever commissioned one other hit, so I'm learning this market. I have no problem putting my faith in you and I'm sure you'll do a good job. The exchange rate is about above 90 right now. So $90 Bitcoin, so $150,000 USD is gonna go 1,670 Bitcoin. If the market tanks in the next few days, I will send more. Here are some random numbers for the picture. Here is the transaction number for 1670 Bitcoin to this Bitcoin wallet address. Good luck and be safe. If you look up this Bitcoin transaction, it was sent on this exact same day, right around this time. If you use a wallet explorer, you can actually trace back the Bitcoins to a wallet that's labeled Silk Road. So this is impossible to fake. And under these circumstances, he did send this money. But there's a lot more to this, so sit tight. March 1st, 2013, 10.06 p.m. Your problem has been taken care of. They seized a bunch of stuff he had with him at the time as well. They said he had a couple laptops and a bunch of USB sticks. Is there any of that that belongs to you? They questioned him and he spilled everything he knew. He said that he and Zinn were actually working together on this scheme to blackmail you and that they were brought in by a third guy who was selling on here for a couple years who is a scam artist. Apparently, he makes selling accounts, sells for a while, then pulls a big scam, and he just keeps on creating new accounts after he does his scams. They got that guy's name also. I will give you that free of charge when I meet them to get the picture and the computer hardware they got. Rest easy though, because he won't be blackmailing anyone again, ever. Now at this point, if you can guess who that third person is, you're going to start to put everything together in your head. I'll spell it out for you at the end, but I don't want to spoil it for now. On April 2nd at 12.55 AM, DPR would write back and say, Excellent work. Please send any info you can get on this third party along with the picture. The picture can be uploaded here. I have no need for any of his possessions, so you can do whatever you want with that stuff. Thank you again for your assistance, DPR. April 2nd, 2013 at 12.59 p.m. The response from Red and White would read the following. Okay, my guys are here now, and here's the information they extracted from Friendly Chemist before the deed. They were working with a guy, real name Andrew Lossery of Surrey. Apparently, this is the guy that turned them on to frauding people on here. He said that he started selling on Silk Road a couple years ago, and since then he's made a career out of making new seller profiles to sell and then rip people off. He told them how to start on here and how to rip people off and asked for a percentage in return. He said that he showed them everything about how to sell and how to pull it off and all that stuff. He didn't remember all the account names he uses or used and then said that Tony76 and Canuck were two of his names that he used on other seller accounts for people he set up or is running himself. I also went and looked at all the possessions they seized from him. The laptops were empty besides Tor and a couple other programs. 
the USB sticks he had were packed full of text files and thousands of addresses from all around the world. We destroyed everything we seized from him, but I kept a text file that was named blackmail.txt that had a ton of addresses in it and other text files. Since you mentioned that he was trying to blackmail you with all that information, I kept that text file in case you needed it. If you don't need it, then let me know and I'll destroy it. I also have the picture with me. A question before I send it to you though. I'm not extremely good with all this anonymity computer operations, but I know pictures store GPS information and the likes that the police can use as evidence. Is it safe to send it over here like that? We took care of him at one of our safe houses, so that worries me a little. I trust your judgment, so I was wondering if there was a way to delete GPS information from a picture before I send it over the internet. Another quick question regarding Bitcoin. How do we withdraw them? I paid the hitters with my own money until I figured out how the Bitcoins worked exactly. As I understand it, Mt. Gox is the main exchange. Is it safe to make an account there to withdraw? Can they link it back to the Silk Road? They require verification, which bothers me a little, so I figured you would know the best way. On April 2nd, at 8.55 p.m., DPR would respond and say, Yes, you can destroy the info. Thanks for taking a look first. Regarding image metadata, you can strip all of that out and it is good practice. The upload page is secure, but I would still have access to that metadata. Of course you can trust me, but what if I was compromised? A decent one can be found for Windows here. Regarding Bitcoin withdrawal, I would avoid Mt. Gox if at all possible, especially if you're withdrawing to a USA account. There are many other exchanges that don't have so much attention on them. You can find them here. I am reluctant to give you a specific recommendation, but look for ones offshore on that list that will do an international wire transfer for a direct Bitcoin payment. Tony76 and Canuck were both blights on an otherwise great track record. What do you think about going after Andrew Lossry? This guy has probably ripped off millions of dollars at this point from me and the rest of the Silk Road community. Here we see that Dread Pirate Roberts wants to take out anyone who's wronged him at this point. At this point, it's not even in self-preservation. He's just trying to grow the Silk Road and build an empire. On April 5th, 2013 at 4.40 a.m., Red and White would write the following. I've sent the file. I had to make sure I did the information removal properly before I sent it so that I did not send GPS information with the picture in case it was intercepted somehow. Please delete the picture as soon as you take a look at it. As for the name, it's Andrew Lostry, aka Tony76, aka Canuck, aka some other names I don't know. From what I got from Friendly Chemist, he has other names on here as well, or is working with other vendors on here like I mentioned before. As far as your question for going after him, I would need to do some asking around to see what kind of information my guys can get on him. Would you like me to look into it? A few hours later, DPR would respond and say, yes please, if you can find him, I would like to know. As far as the picture that's being uploaded, if it's not crystal clear already, that's the picture of Friendly Chemist's body. So, let's move on. At 10.22 a.m., Red and White would respond and say, Did you get the picture? Let me know so I can delete the rest of the ones I have. Finding him would be possible. I can almost guarantee it. But I stop short of guaranteeing anything unless I'm 100% certain I can get the job done. I don't do that so I don't look like an idiot if I can't accomplish something that I said I can. We have a huge stake in the trafficking on this side of the country, so if he's grabbing product from anyone, we would be able to find out who and get to him. Would you want him dealt with if possible? I ask because I don't want to send people to hunt for him and then nothing come of it once they find him. Also, please don't forget to delete that picture. I've received the picture and deleted it. Thank you again for your swift action. I would like to go after Andrew, though it is important to me that we make sure he is who Blake said he is. I would rather miss a chance to take him out than hit an innocent person. If he's our man, then he likely has substantial assets to be recovered. Perhaps we can hold him and question him. I'd like to connect with you on real-time chat to discuss this further with you. It requires downloading the chat client Pigeon and the plugin off the record and some basic configuration to connect. If you're open to this idea, I'll send you instructions. This is how I communicate with my closest people. If not, we can keep communicating here, but it's much slower. April 5th, 9.48 p.m. Red and White writes, It was my pleasure. I hate thieves almost as much as I hate informants. About holding and questioning someone, it adds to the risk the longer we have to hold slash transport a target. The safest way to do it is get in, do it, and get out as soon as possible. As far as there being a way to verify that he is the intended target, making him speak would not be a problem, and of course we would not have him done if he was not the right person we were looking for. Since you said you'd like to go after him, I will send two of my guys to do some recon right now and find out what I can about him and get back to you immediately. We can discuss the price later once we know more. As for the real-time chat, send the information over and I'll have my tech guy look at it. He handles all my security with phones and PGP, Blackberries, so he would probably know better than me how to set everything up. 
on April 6 at 12.57 a.m., DPR would write to Red and White and say, My gut tells me he's our man, but I'd hate to be wrong. Your men were able to get info from Blake, but maybe they can do the same thing with Andrew. He's likely sitting on many thousands of stolen bitcoins, perhaps tens of thousands. So I'd like to think we'd want to work him over to get those funds back. They could be on an encrypted drive only he can unlock. Taking him out would erase the coins forever. In the process of getting him to return the funds, I hope we could confirm that he is indeed the one Blake says he is. Here are the instructions for accessing the chat server from a Windows computer. Attached in this message is just the instructions. I'm going to go over the domain name and the actual account later on. On April 6, 12.20 p.m., Red and White would finally get back to DPR and say, I found out who Andrew is exactly and who he was packing up his supply from. I also talked to a supplier and he said he mainly grabbed a lot of things that would get this video demonetized. He said he always goes through phases where he grabs a ton of product and then stops for a couple of weeks and then starts again. Sounds consistent with what Friendly Chemist said about how they run the stealing from buyers on here. He said he last heard from Andrew a couple days ago. He said he was planning on moving out of the province because things were too hot down here. That might be because he found out about Zinn and Friendly Chemist and now he's scared. I also had a chance to actually sit down and talk to my hitters about exactly what happened and how everything went down in detail. They said that Friendly Chemist was pleading with them and offering to give up Andrew and that Andrew was a seller here by the name of Tony and a bunch of other names, amongst others. He said that when he first turned them on to the idea of doing this big scheme, that he would often talk about how he stole so much money and that he once stole 15,000 online currency coins from one person on the site and how easy stealing money was on here. Does that ring a bell? Did he steal 1,500 bitcoins from a buyer here? That would be an easy way to find out if this Andrew person is the same person you think it is. Do you have his transaction history to see if he actually did steal 15k bitcoins from someone? I trust my hitters to do a good job and they are excellent at what they do, which is take people out or interrogate slash scare people and they told me they didn't think he was lying. The info I have on him right now is that he works and lives with three other people and they all sell product. He is in contact with his supplier who actually through a line of middlemen gets his product from us at the end of the food chain. Do you want to deal with this Andrew guy or do you want me to put the team on standby? At 8.37 p.m. that same night, DPR would write back and say, I'm confident enough that it is him to move forward. Can we round up all four of them, separate them, and get them to out each other by giving up their stolen money? Recovering the funds is going to be tricky if you aren't in direct contact with your team or if your team doesn't know how bitcoins work. If you have the other usernames Friendly Chemist mentioned, that will help me piece together things on my end. Regarding chat, there should be a certificate to accept. When it connects, does that show up? A couple hours later, Red and White gets back and says, It won't even connect. It's just stuck on connecting. And I copy and paste all the information for the login and password, etc. So it should be good. I also check Tor to see what port to use. It won't connect for some reason. Do I have to fill in any more of the details? Local alias or anything like that? As for getting all four of them, it would be possible, but we would have to get them all at once so no one gets away. I would send four hitters instead of two to make sure there was no fuck-ups. I'm not sure on when they are planning on leaving the province, though. The guy that has been feeding me information on him says the guy's a degenerate gambler, so I don't know how much of the funds he will have on hand. He says he owes a ton of people money too. My guess is that he's been pulling the scams to fuel his gambling problem like a degenerate. It would make sense why he's teaching other people how to scam as well, since it has been too profitable for him to keep it to himself. Probably because he owes some money and then he offers them to show him how to do it as a way of paying back. I will have them take whatever they have on hand, but I don't want to pay my hitters to be hanging around with them for too long since they are doing four people. Unfortunately, there are no bulk discounts for jobs like this. Usually the price goes up the more difficult it is. Since you're easy to work with, I would be able to offer you the same rate as last time, times four, if that works for you. Let me know. If it doesn't, please also let me know as soon as you can so I can call my guys off. They've been doing info gathering this whole time on Andrew and his whole crew. DPR would later write back and say, Okay, let's just hit Andrew and leave it at that. Try to recover the funds, but if not, then not. How much do you need for this? On April 8th, 7.11 a.m., Red and White would get back and respond and say, If you want to hit Andrew only, I can have it done for 150 just like last time. We wouldn't be able to do it at their place though, because there's always at least a few of them there, from what I'm told since it's their home slash office. So we wouldn't be able to recover any of his things. It's up to you what you want done, but we can send hitters into their home slash office if they're only doing one of them. Do you not need the people he is working with dealt with also? If they're working with him, it means they're doing the same thing as him. It would also be easier for the hitters to get to them in there so that they have a chance for covering anything if he has anything there. It would also be better because it wouldn't be a public hit. If we just take Andrew, there's nothing to say that the other three wouldn't start up somewhere else with a new selling ID. 
It is of course up to you what you want done and how, since you're the client. I was pretty certain you would want them all taken care of, so I had an associate send me a couple of his out-of-town hitters to accompany our local hitters. It is not a problem as I can just send them back and cover their travel expenses, but I obviously would like for them to not go back empty-handed. My mistake for not confirming what you wanted before I had the extra hitters sent down, but it's not really a problem if you don't want the others dealt with. I had a hard time connecting to the Silk Road for the last 24 hours or I would have asked before having them sent down. So if you'd like to do the others as well, I would be able to have it done for 500k. If you do not want all of them and just want Andrew, it would be 150k. I would prefer to do all four as it would be better than having to get Andrew somewhere else and have no chance of recovering any potential product slash money that he may have. If you are certain he has that much product slash money, I think it would make sense to do it at their home slash office. It's up to you though, just let me know what to do as soon as you can since I do not know when they are leaving the province, and if they do leave the province, the price would go up exponentially. If you would just like to get Andrew done, send 150k to the same address you sent the other funds to. If you'd like all four of them done, and the product slash money recovered from there, send 500k USD to the same address you sent the other funds to. In the morning I will check the Bitcoin wallet first thing, and I will know what you want me to do based on how much you sent, and I will have it done as soon as possible. Speak to you soon. At 6.50 p.m. on April 8th, DPR would write back and say, Hmm, okay, I'll defer to your better judgment and hope we can recover some assets from them. 500k in BTC or 3,000 Bitcoin at $166 of Bitcoin has been sent to your address and here is the transaction number. Once again, we can check this transaction number and it was in fact sent from the Silk Road. On April 11th, 2013, 10.49 p.m., Red and White would finally get back and say, Our hitters have been watching their house and we have a one-week window to do it, but I wanted to ask you a couple questions before giving them the green light. The price of bitcoins is trading at $61 right now. How is this going to work? Because you mentioned that you would take care of price fluctuations. We haven't withdrawn any of the bitcoins. DPR would later write back and say, Regarding the 3k coins I sent, get the best price you can for them and let me know if you are short and I'll send you more to cover it. Regarding chat, I made a mistake. You should add me at dread at this onion link. Now this was the exact same handle that Ross was caught logged into into his chat service when the FBI caught him. So keep that in mind. To summarize the last bit of messages, long story short, the hit goes through, they don't really recover much money, and then Ross sends an extra 2,500 bitcoins to make up for the price. Now, let's do a final analysis on these messages. As interesting as these messages are to read, there's something I haven't told you. What we just read through is exactly how someone went about scamming 7,225 Bitcoin off Dread Pirate Roberts. At the time that this Bitcoin was sent, it was actually worth about $1 million, give or take. But today, it's worth over 60 million. All of these hits were paid for, but Blake, Kirkhoff, Zinn, Andrew, and all the people involved with these hits aren't actually real people, because there's absolutely no proof of any of these guys ever going missing or ever existing in the first place. It took a while for Ross's investigation to pick up on this, but this is in fact what happened, and even in the court documents they say he got hit with an elaborate scam. Keep in mind though, that in DPR's mind, these people were 100% real, and he was completely willing to pay to have people taken out. We're going to talk about Ross's trial in a bit, but up until 2018, nobody knew who Red and White was. Here's the reality though. DPR got played by one person, and that one person is alleged to be James Ellingson. In a later investigation, Bitcoin was traced from Red and White's accounts on the Silk Road to another seller on the Silk Road named Mary Jane is my muse, and both of them were registered on a Canadian Bitcoin exchange that had James's driver's license on it. As a result, James trying to cash out ultimately ended up getting him caught. He's currently out on bail and waiting trial. Since Tony76 is likely Lucy Drop, this makes this guy one of the most prolific scammers on the Silk Road. It appears that James initially sought out to blackmail Ross as friendly chemist with $500,000 but ended up thinking quick on his feet and ended up getting double the amount. As cool as it is to see someone get worked over like this, heaven forbid Ross Ulbricht actually got his hands on a real hitman. To this day, a lot of people still deny the fact that Ross actually ordered these hits and they believe it's completely fake, and I'm going to be debunking that later on in this video. But for now, let's get into the trial. Now, 
Now let's take a step back and look at the trial and conviction of Ross Ulbricht. Keep in mind, my goal here is to cover this in a somewhat objective manner because both parties involved seem to be potentially stretching the truth. Ross pleaded not guilty despite being caught red-handed logged into the website, so it made me really curious as to what his defense actually was in this case. I went through countless pages on this actual court case and what they planned on using as a legal defense, I honestly don't know how they ever expected to win. I'm paraphrasing here, but Ross's legal defense went with the story that Ross created the Silk Road not to make money, but as a social experiment. Then they claimed at some point Ross sold the website in 2011 and thereafter he bought it back just in time to get caught red-handed, where supposedly someone basically airdropped the diary onto his computer to frame him. This defense never provided any physical evidence of Ross actually selling or buying back the website, but they still went with the story. Remember what I said about Dread Pirate Roberts being a very clever name, and it was actually given to him by his mentor, Variety Jones, someone who helped out Ross very closely. He actually suggested the name Dread Pirate Roberts if he ever got caught, so that way he could say he was just a fall guy. Variety Jones also taught Ross a wide variety of other things. He was basically just his right-hand man. The defense essentially claimed that the Dread Pirate Roberts forum account was shared by multiple people, which I find very hard to believe, but more on that later. This was to explain away the messages we read regarding the hits, as the defense claimed they weren't sent by Ross, but some other Dread Pirate Roberts that they never actually named. On top of that, the defense argued that the real Dread Pirate Roberts couldn't be Ross because DPR was a criminal mastermind. However, one thing I will say is that the Dread Pirate Roberts in those chat logs is not a criminal mastermind because he got scammed for almost a million dollars. If anything, that guy's pretty naive. The amount of assumptions you'd have to make to believe this story is honestly insane, but I will say lawyers have a good way of getting out of things, so I am not surprised. On the other side of things, where I believe the government is potentially shifting the narrative, is how they actually track down the Silk Road website. Something I haven't mentioned yet is that in 2012, the FBI managed to infiltrate where the Silk Road website was hosted in Iceland. Part of tracking down Ross and catching him red-handed was getting access to the back end of the site, because that way they could use it to find when Ross was actually logged in. If the government used some form of illegal spying tactic, then this would have potentially infringed on Ross's Fourth Amendment right and could have easily nullified some of the charges against him. It is speculated that the NSA had some involvement with their method, but to this day, the government claims they used a legal method. I should also note that there were two agents that were caught stealing Bitcoin that were both involved with this investigation. These people were Sean Bridges and Carl Force. Both went to jail for quite a while and the money was recovered. As far as their role in anything else in this case, I would say that's not very substantial, despite what the defense argued. These two instances of corrupt individuals were not actually allowed to be involved with Ross's case, however, they were both later tried separately. Something to consider about this case is that it was setting a precedent for any future darknet marketplaces. Ross's legal team should have expected that the government would try and make an example of them and set precedent, so in my opinion, fighting this case was probably a bad idea. To prove my point, Ross received a double life sentence plus 40 years without the possibility for parole, which definitely seems excessive and almost like a slap in the face to the legal team defending him. FreeRoss.org claims that he wasn't given a plea deal, but if you actually read what they have to say, it seems to contradict that. I'm reading this word for word off their website and it says, Ross was arrested on nonviolent conspiracy charges that carried 10 years to life. The prosecutor told him that if he didn't plead guilty, they would add the kingpin charge, which would raise the mandatory minimum to 20 years. I'm not saying Ross wouldn't have gotten life in prison either way, but this logic seems to contradict itself. Ross was convicted of computer hacking, conspiracy to traffic narcotics, and money laundering. At first, the government had also attempted to hit him with a murder for hire charge. I will say there is definitely substantial evidence to say that Dread Pirate Roberts paid for hits. Considering the chat logs included well-known vendors, it had redacted customer information, and Bitcoin transactions that are impossible to tamper with. The fact that these hits were all a part of an incredibly elaborate scam and that the people he had ordered hits on never existed makes it a hell of a lot harder to convince a jury. There's not really much legal precedent on ordering a hit on a person that was never alive. You could argue that including this charge weakens the prosecution's case overall. Keep in mind, they didn't even know the real identity of Red and White until 2018. If you don't know who the hitman was and you don't know who the victims were, it's very hard to convict someone. If you take a look at how punishments are weighed, particularly in the charge of conspiracy to traffic narcotics, it is, to a certain extent, based on the quantity of substances moved, and seeing as Ross's site moved $1.2 billion worth of substance, this charge alone was enough to put him away for a very long time. 
It definitely seems like they never needed the murder for hire charges to begin with, and the fact that they included them does seem like they could have used it to smear him in the media and push this court case through quickly, I will say. So all in all, let me summarize. Do I think Ross got a perfectly fair trial? No. Do I think Ross got an over-the-top punishment? Yes. But do I think Ross was perfectly innocent? No, and this leads me to the next section of this video. When I first started researching this topic, I wanted to fully defend Ross and point out the injustice of his sentencing, but there's a ton of misinformation floating around. I initially heard about this from the Deep Web documentary and the freeross.org side of things, but the more I looked into this topic, the more I realized that this organization is in straight up denial of what Ross actually did. You guys do not believe that that Ross, that he saw this through, that he was responsible for, for more than kind of the creation of Silk Road. Correct. Not for a minute. They say they've traced lots of money back to Ross. What do you think Ross's role was? I, I have no idea. I'd like to see the evidence. Bought and sold. I mean, what do you think should be uh, a punishment for him, if any? We would like to see Ross acquitted on all charges. To clarify, I personally don't have much of a problem with Ross creating something like the Silk Road. Just because the Silk Road went down, it will never stop other marketplaces from popping up and doing the exact same thing until some laws change. If there's something we've learned from prohibition, supply will always meet demand. Where I personally draw the line with all of this, however, is when Dread Pirate Roberts attempted violence. In Ross's mind, the people he was ordering hits on were absolutely real people, and when he received those photos to confirm what he had done from Red and White, he still continued to do it. It was literally only a matter of time before the guy got his hands on a real hitman, and he would have had an unlimited supply of money to potentially take out anyone he wanted. To this day, some people say because Ross Ulbrich was never charged with violence, therefore he could have never been violent. This is a logical fallacy. By that same logic, you could say that O.J. Simpson is innocent. Ever since this trial, Ross's parents have been campaigning for him to be released from prison, and I honestly think they are right to do so. But where I have a problem is when you mislead people to further your agenda. It's a hell of a lot harder to convince people to sign a petition if the person you're advocating for was potentially violent. So let's go through some of FreeRoss.org's claims. A perfect example I'd like to start with comes from the common misconception page of the FreeRoss.org website. Here they claim that Ross Ulbrich didn't create the Silk Road for financial gain. This is honestly laughable because it takes two seconds to realize that's not true. Prior to creating the Silk Road, Ross had multiple business attempts that completely failed. Ross had also applied for multiple citizenships prior to getting caught. If you're applying for a citizenship in the Dominican Republic, you're probably trying to launder money out of the country. FreeRoss.org claims that because Ross lived frugally, he wasn't in it for the money. But the moment you bring more than $10,000 cash to any bank, they're going to start asking you a lot of questions. On top of that, if you look through his Altoid account post history, the guy's obsessed with money and he even says how he's not a millionaire yet. Nobody starts a dark net marketplace just for the sport of it. On FreeRoss.org, they claim that the purpose of the site was not to sell illegal substances, but to be a free market economic experiment where people could basically buy whatever they want. But then they go on to have a list of rules of items that they're not allowed to sell. They claim that some of the reason of these rules is so that other people wouldn't harm or defraud others. But if that were true, why did Ross Ulbrich buy nine fake IDs off of his own website? These are just a couple of examples of easy bits to disprove, but I'd like to focus on something much more substantial, and it's the FreeRoss.org's claim that there was multiple Dread Pirate Roberts on the same forum account. In this situation, I'd like to go through their supposed evidence and show how it can pretty much be disproven. The first piece of evidence that the organization claims for the existence of multiple Dread Pirate Roberts comes from the fact that Ross couldn't have created the website by himself. This is true, but doesn't prove the point the court was looking for. Ross hired people to work for him and his staff was on payroll. All of them had their own separate forum account. Ross knew none of his admins personally, so it makes absolutely no sense that Ross would share the same account at any given point in time. Ross was a bright guy and he also asked multiple questions under the handle Frosty when it came to initially setting up the site. Regardless, this doesn't support the claim that there were multiple Dread Pirate Roberts acting under one forum account over a different period of time. The next piece of evidence that they list is that Ross told his friend that he sold the website in 2011. I believe this to be true, but if you take a look at the court documents and see the context, then you'll see how this is actually the twisting of the truth. 
It appears that Ross's friend told someone a little bit too much about Ross's involvement with the Silk Road. That person later commented on his Facebook wall and Ross's friend was concerned and urged him to shut down the site. As a result, I believe Ross consoled his friend by saying, I can't because I already sold it to someone. I believe this was to get his friend to stop worrying about him. There's absolutely no physical evidence to suggest a transaction involving the site. If this were true, Ross wouldn't have continued to operate the site up until 2013. And it would have been as simple as providing a Bitcoin transaction to prove the sale went through. There's absolutely no other way that this guy could have accepted payment other than Bitcoin. Here it makes absolutely no sense that Ross would have to rely on his friend's testimony instead of just providing evidence. Moving on, the next piece of evidence from this website states that someone logged into the Dread Pirate Roberts forum account after Ross was taken into custody. Once again, this is twisting the truth. By the time Ross was arrested, the feds had access to the back end of the website and the investigation was still ongoing. The fact that we have access to those messages we read over time shows that the FBI directly had access to Ross's account as well. There is no doubt in my mind that the person who logged into Ross's account after he was in custody was a federal agent. Once again, it makes absolutely no sense that Ross would ever share an account. Next up in terms of their false evidence is the claim that Dread Pirate Roberts failed a digital handshake. A handshake or a digital handshake is a set question to make sure you're talking with a real person on the other end of the computer. Basically, if I told you beforehand that you could identify me by asking a question like, how sociable are you? And I told you the correct answer was barely, you could then ask me that question in a public chat room to figure out if I was the real person behind the computer. So in this instance, freeross.org claims that one of the admins failed a handshake in a chat room prior to Ross getting arrested. If you take two seconds to read through the full reference they've provided, he later completed the handshake on another personal question that only DPR would have known. Even though this isn't really evidence to prove that someone else is behind the computer, this was the pigeon chat room, not the place where DPR ordered the hits, on the forum account. Alright, now let's move on to the claim that Mark Carpellis was Dread Pirate Roberts. This is the smartest piece of false evidence for this entire case. If you don't know who Mark Carpellis is, he's basically a supervillain in the cryptocurrency community. FreeRoss.org claims that the real Dread Pirate Roberts was Mark Carpellis and references multiple emails from the special agent working on this investigation. Long story short, Mark Carpellis was the first target of this investigation and was the first suspect. Because they hadn't found the Altoid lead yet, he was the best person that they could go with. Mark Carpellis owned the Bitcoin exchange Mt. Gox, and at the time, it would make the most financial sense that he would be running the Silk Road. The special agent working on this case ended up getting a search warrant for his email addresses. Long story short, they searched through his email and they didn't find anything tying him to the Silk Road, but they did find him guilty on charge of 1960. Charge 1960 is running an unlicensed money business. It appears that Mark Carpellis worked out some kind of deal where he would aid in the investigation of the Silk Road in exchange to be released on the charge of 1960. To save you from reading through hundreds and hundreds of pages of legal documents, long story short, there's no physical evidence tying Mark Carpellis to the Silk Road. Now you might be wondering why I went through all this trouble to cover all these seemingly false claims even though I agree Ross didn't get a fair trial. In my opinion, a path to redemption starts with you actually admitting you did something wrong, and I don't see that happening here. To me, it's obvious that Ross's mom in this organization is just trying to do and say anything to get her son freed, but I can't help but feel like she's accepting donations based on people not knowing the full story. If you look at their homepage, you'll see just how much support this cause has gotten on the basis of seemingly deceiving the public. I don't think all of these politicians and such would have endorsed her had they known the full story, let alone all the people that pledged monthly. What this organization is doing is playing the political game. At this point, it's not even about the facts anymore. It's just about trying to influence people and win power to get Ross pardoned. Only lost New Hampshire by a few thousand votes. I think three or four thousand votes, if I'm not mistaken. And if basically, if Trump pardons Ross Ulbricht, it's very likely that a lot of us single issue voters here in New Hampshire will, will, will vote for Trump, who wouldn't otherwise. So I think that Trump could win New Hampshire by, uh, by pardoning Ross Ulbricht, and he could piss off a lot of his enemies. Like I can see a wide variety of arguments being made for any outcome of this case. Some people might think he deserves his life sentence for ordering hits on people. Some people might think he's not guilty at all. I can also see this just as a case of the mother doing anything to get her son back. There's definitely going to be a wide variety of opinions here, so I'm going to leave it up to you. This is Barely Sociable. Have a good night.